So I'm Lois Donnelly, um, interviewing Professor Virginia Brown on the 26th of July 2022 over Zoom. And we're discussing their life and career in the context of feminism and its history within psychology. So first of all, then, I wonder if you could just tell me a little bit about yourself. So maybe in terms of kind of the trajectory of um, your career and the topics of your work. Yeah, I think it's, it's really interesting to reflect on how <coughs> my career is now a career trajectory that's really becoming increasingly unusual for people. So I, I had a year off when I finished high school because I had this kind of like uncertain what I wanted to do. I thought I wanted to do photography and I got um, rejected from the art school that I applied for, right. which sort of sent me in a bit of a spin. And over the year of being exceptionally bored with you know, shop, I decided that psychology was you know where my hopes and dreams lay. Mm -hmm. Of course, having like absolutely no idea what psychology was beyond clinical psychology and imagining a great career for myself solving people's problems um you know i think as many um many people who enter psychology as youngsters do and uh, we had no you know in new zealand certainly at that time there was no coverage of psychology in us in this high school curriculum or anything like that mm. um so I, I started psychology after a year off at, at auckland university in new zealand um, at the time it was this um incredibly sort of competitive degree to get into it was really hard to get into psychology and I had to line up for you know ages to to, to get in and so I think that sort of like slight um challenge at the start maybe um fixed my commitment to the discipline um because I'm somehow still very committed to the discipline even though I'm very critical of the discipline so it's a funny sort of um position to be in mm. um and I was like clinical psychology, that's what I want to do. And then I think as I started studying, I had just like this kind of mind blown experience of wow, this thing is so vast and huge and there's so many different areas and they're all fascinating and interesting. And I kind of just got so involved and loved them all, but it was in my very first um first year general psychology class, it was called that I um, was taught by a feminist psychologist who introduced kind of feminist ideas, and they were the ones that really grabbed me. But anyway, I'm getting diverted from my trajectory. So I finished my um, bachelor's and decided that was it, um, and was heading off to explore the world and give up on academia. And um, I got my, I got offered a master's scholarship, and I was living in Australia, and um, I really had to make a difficult decision of whether I came back to do a master's or not. And so um, my career was not interrupted, as it were. I, I, went, I went back and did a, a two-year master's degree, um, which was supervised by a feminist psychologist, without that then, I'm sure. And then during that process, I really became kind of clear that I wanted to do a PhD by the end of my second year, I'd been kind of talked out of clinical psychology and um, I loved research. And so doing the master's really solidified that. And I was incredibly fortunate to get a scholarship to the UK um, to do a PhD. Um, and so about eight months after I finished my master's, I turned up to start a PhD supervised by Celia Kitzinger and Sue Wilkinson um, at Loughborough University. And it was a particularly um, rich cohort of us that arrived and started at the same time um, in 97. Um, and yeah, I um, finished my PhD um, within the three years, which is <laughs> sort of, it sounds like it's one of those brags, but it's not really. I was solely driven and worked incredibly hard to get it finished in that time frame because that was when my money ran out and I had no other way of supporting myself. So I think I submitted on the last day of my um, scholarship. And um, and I was thinking that I'd stay in the UK and I um, got encouraged to apply for a lectureship at Auckland Uni. And, I've, um, and it, the process took eight months and it was so stressful because I was kind of caught in this indecision 
Um, but I got a lectureship at Auckland, um, which I think is still miraculous given the shape of the department and what they focused on and what I was doing my research on. Um, and I've been there ever since. So I'm now a professor in the department, which is now the School of Psychology. And I've been here, yeah, over 20 years. So I've had this kind of very um, linear, um, uninterrupted sort of trajectory in my career. And, you know, I think it, it's offered a lot of sort of stability and options to do things in the context of that, you know, not having to navigate the difficulties of precarious and short-term contracts that so many so many do now. And um, from my master's um, research on, I've been kind of interested in kind of gender, gendered bodies, sex, sexuality and health really as those broad sort of intersecting areas. So my master's thesis looked at survival cancer prevention policy in New Zealand and how decisions had been made not to highlight primary prevention opportunities and specifically around HPV um, connections and the prevention of HPV as part of cervical cancer prevention. Now that's completely changed, but at the time it was not even being discussed. Um, it was before any vaccine like Gardasil. And then my PhD um, was going to sort of expand on from that and I was interested in kind of gynecology and gynecological cancers and uh, vaginal reconstruction and kind of heteronormative ideas about um, sex and penile vaginal intercourse and the kind of ideas that seem to shape um, women's experiences and understanding and surgical practices and interventions. Um, and that spun out into just being a PhD about representations of men around the vagina. Um, because there was something I was like, I'll go and look and do some research and find out about this topic. Yeah, nothing. Um, and so that was an interesting um, and fantastic experience. And then I moved on and looked at a range of topics, uh, genital cosmetic surgery, um, sexual health, um, STI preventions, healthy eating. Um, yeah, a whole range. So it was a very long answer to your no. short question. <laughs> <laughs> no, absolutely. Brilliant. Thank you. Um yeah, so I suppose then psychology was kind of almost your second choice in a way. But um, what was what was what attracted you to psychology in particular? Do you think? I think I've always been like as a person. I think I've always been a mix of quite sort of analytic and questioning about things, mm -hmm. and kind of empathetic and listening and being, you know, the friend that people talk to or, you know, people that kind of gave people advice or, you know, helped people through things. And so I think that kind of combination was like, okay, this thing allows me, you know, I was still fantasizing that I was going to be a clinical psychologist <laughs> to have this kind of analytic take on things and also sort of um, help shift things. And I think, you know, growing up in a... Uh, in a, in a context of sort of um, an idea that you can and should engage with the world and change the world, um, I'm kind of curious that my focus went on sort of, sort of like individuals at that point, but it, it did, but then it rapidly disappeared. Um, mm. I, you know, I, I had a, a particular um, colleague now, the supervisor, mentor, who, you know, really sort of, talked me through um, the decision around kind of like not even deciding to try to get into clinical psychology and it's virtually impossible to get into clinical psychology here. Our programs are so tiny, mm -hmm. um, but abandoning that and, and embracing the aspects about liberating. Yeah. Good that's... feminist mentoring in retrospect. Mm. Who, who was that? If... Um, Nick McGavey, oh. who's... Um, uh, a feminist psychologist still here in Auckland. Yeah, yeah. Oh, amazing. Um, yeah. So when you kind of switched gears then from the clinical to the research, um, what made you feel like you wanted to carry on with that path? I think it was just. I think it's hard to say, except that I just loved research. I just loved 
thinking and making sense of and trying to understand and um, engaging with information, you know, in whatever shape or form it was. Yeah. And so one of the things that um, most students don't do, but this is an opportunity to do at Auckland, is an undergraduate research project. And, you know, mostly we don't, we don't, most students don't do that as part of their degree, but if you're really sort of keen, you can. And Nicola Gavey was, um, I think had a project that she wasn't offering for an undergraduate um, project, but I basically went and badgered her and made my case that she should take me on and I should be her, <laughs> her undergraduates. Supervising now, I know how much how much work undergraduate student projects are to supervisor, and I'm even more grateful than I was at the time. Mm. But that very early experience, and that was a that was a project which was um, looking at the publication of clinical case material and looking at kind of grappling with some of the ethical questions around how clinical case material gets published um, and what sort of details and information gets included, and some of the kind of ethical elements around that um, but that just I think that just sort of set me off I'm going you know wow research is amazing it's you know like it's yeah it's hard to it's hard to describe it it's just like you know when you find something that just feels so right mm. yeah oh that's that's interesting um so where along the journey do you think your kind of feminist identity started developing it's such a good question, and I was on a panel a couple of days ago about gender and the university and equity and these sorts of things, and so I was pondering this a little bit for that mm. as well. And I think, you know, I, I grew up in this, in the, um, you know, I was born in 70, had most of my sort of adolescence in the 80s, and it was that era of girls can do anything. You know, that was this kind of like this strong motto of opportunity and that gender is not um, something that can or should hold you back or something like that. Mm -hmm. So I got to uni, despite having grown up where I think, you know, my mother was just inherently feminist and I grew up in a single mum household um, and, grow, and kind of having that sort of analysis. And she was, you know, she'd been very much kind of activist and engaged in social change, but hadn't brought me up explicitly as feminist in any kind of way. Like it wasn't, I wasn't part of teen groups or anything like that. So I got to uni not, not sort of having that as a particular identity, not particularly being interested in gender. Um, and it's interesting reflecting on how I think high school context, you know, didn't sort of facilitate that either. Um, yeah. and I didn't, you know, I didn't choose papers that focused on gender. Like I'm, I constantly shake my head and go, there was a, you know, there was a gender and psychology course that I could have taken and I didn't take it. And I think, you know, and I have to remember that when I'm going, you know, supervising students, I'm like, why should you take that course? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I did the other one. And I'm like, this is the best one. <laughs> anyway, I think, you know, my... My um, my interest in feminist things and feminist um, psychology just kind of grew through university. And there wasn't one sort of particular instance or particular event um, that sort of triggered it. I think Nicola gave me lectured there in my first year and she um, did a specific module that included things like violence and sex and, and gender. And those things really grabbed me. Like her lectures were the ones which, you know, that's why I badgered her terribly to let me <laughs> to let to, to let me do the project in third year. And so, um, and you know, and and Canvas was a really, um, you know, I, I I think I was kind of like in, at, at university at a time when students were really still quite activists. And so we had protests all the time about things and, you know, protests and activism to try and get um, uh, abusive men banned from campus and things like that. So there was just this kind of um, feminist activism and engagement without necessarily being kind of explicitly 
named as such in that context. But by the end of that time, I was certainly explicitly kind of reading and engaging with feminist scholarship, although maybe the, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know about when I would have enthusiastically adopted the label. I can't remember that. Um, it was certainly within my master's I was, but I'm not sure at what point it happened. Mm. I can't remember that one. But I suppose it's quite a process, as as you've described there, of kind of like yeah, slowly, um, slowly getting into that, and um, yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah, and I think you can have these kind of sort of dualities. Like I can look back on my life and go, you know, I went to, I did a a period of time. My school offered these kind of exchanges, which are a bit unusual in the New Zealand context, and I did some schooling in Germany, and I, you know absolutely was infuriated by the fact that our um, physical education classes, for instance, were, you know, separated into boys and girls. And I was very sporty and loved sport. And I couldn't do the sport because the girls just did, like, girl sport and the boys yeah. did the real, the real sport. And they were, like, playing basketball. And I loved basketball. And I was, like, you know, argued my way into playing basketball with the boys. And wow. Uh, at, at my high school, I argued to be allowed to play in our inter-schools competition because it was a small school and we didn't have girls' teams um, mm. for sports. You know, I, I argued that I should be able to play hockey with the boys and I, I managed about two games before the other schools objected. And, you know, so I had these kind of things where, you know, the sort of uh, gendered norms and ideas and expectations and kind of ingrained misogyny of society were kind of butting up against me but I didn't have a kind of framework to put that in mm. um, and a, a, a thing to kind of attach it to if that makes sense and I still like and, and those things could kind of exist and disconnect so I was saying on in this other panel that I have this like eternal shame because as I, despite having a bad memory this memory won't go away of sitting in a tutorial as a as a maybe first year student saying, you know, well, I've never been discriminated on the basis of gender. And just go, like, oh my God, you know, like, how could I say that? Another thing where I have to give empathy if another student sees us and go, no, that was me once. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> understand that position. But I, I look back on it now and I was like, those two things could coexist, you know, those experiences where I, you know, really at a personal level been quite fighting against things which were unjust and other things and yet could still sort of articulate that. So, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, no, absolutely. Think, think about, I think what I think is useful to hold on to in relation to that is in some of the kind of um, activisms and discussions that you find now, I find there is the sort of, there can be, in some spaces, not all, a kind of... Um, hope for, demand for, drive for kind of perfectionism and perfectness in our political take on things. And it's useful to go, well, you know, I got things wrong all over the place and I fucked up all over the place. I probably shouldn't say that on that. <laughs> I messed up. I messed up all over the place and, you know, continue to do so because, you know, we're not perfect and we're more complex than that and we're situated in, in context. And so, mm. yeah, I think it's useful to have that kind of sense of, um, the understanding that you know it's it's that's what it's like you know we're imperfect through these various various contexts and processes that we find ourselves in yeah absolutely that's such a good point um yes so I suppose then did that kind of um fluidly come into your work you know of, of feminist values in, in, into that work that you then did in your PhD and beyond yeah absolutely by my master's I was completely kind of um thinking and operating within a kind of feminist framework and I'm sure that was um Nicola's key influence and in kind of shaping things um and she had a we did a, a master's for two years, so a year of talk courses and then a year of um, a year of research. And the best course I ever did um, as a master's student was Nicola's course, which was on psychology and critical theory. And it was ideas and concepts and 
values and, you know, interrogating psychology, interrogating the discipline. Um, and it was absolutely brilliant. And so that that context um, was key, I think, in, in really starting to deeply engage with feminist concepts and, and thinking and psychology. And then, yeah, like, um, my master's was completely kind of situated within that. And then, you know, I was very um, enthusiastic and deliberately seeking sort of feminist psychology supervisors. Um, and, you know, Celia and Sue was a um, key suggestion from Nicola as a, you know, as a really good place to go and, you know, pursue research and yeah. feminist psychology. Oh, wow. Amazing. Um, so w would you say that they were key mentors and, and were, was there any, any other key mentors on that, on that path? I think, yeah. So I, um, you know, I was kind of sitting at this intersection of kind of discourse approaches and discourse analysis and, and feminist psychology. So Lafra was, you know, the sort of one of the two dream options. Um, yeah. and so, um, yeah, I think um, I think Sue Wilkinson, Celia Pitzinger really um, saw themselves and took a role to be kind of mentors to their students. And we, the expectations of us were high, um, which I guess made our expectations of ourselves be high. Um, it was quite intense at time. Okay. Um, but it was a very vibrant environment and they mentored us. You know, I, I remember one of my first supervision discussions, which was really asking me, you know, about, you know, what I wanted, what my purpose was, where I saw myself going, you know, was I heading into academia or, you know, why was I doing a PhD? And the, the, sort of discussion was like this is so I know how to mentor and supervise you and I know what you need in this and so within that then all sorts of kind of um, opportunities were offered so we were sort of pushed pushed um, into um, things like participating in PALS like they you know encouraged us to go very early on you know for maybe the first, our first year as, as students and to start presenting and to engage and to connect and to, to, um, and to think and to question and to sort of um, be very actively part of an intellectual world. Yeah, that's, um, that's amazing and really beneficial, I suppose, for, um, for that so, like, so early on. Um in your in in that path yeah it was really amazing to kind of go to that first powers conference and sort of to be surrounded by these people who who felt like the kind of giants in feminist psychology and already by that said you know I was fully immersed in critical psychology and you know rejecting any kind of positivist um, psychology sort of approaches and so North American psychology, although there are amazing feminist psychologists in that context, you know, that that context for me wasn't interesting because of the kind of dominance of positivism, I guess, as a kind of influencing frame. Mm -hmm. And so to go to somewhere like Powell's, these were many of those people who are the absolute kind of, um, yeah, the, the titans, as it were, in the, in the field. Um, and then I guess the, the the fourth person I would really know as a feminist sort of mentor mm -hmm. and in a much less formal sense because I think, you know, Nicola um, gave the, um, Sue Wilkinson and Celia Pitzing in informal kind of supervisory roles and then, you know, other aspects. Um, and then much kind of later would be um, Leon Tifa in the, U, in the U.S., so a key sort of feminist psychologist working in sex and sexuality and social construction of sexuality and then doing that and kind of operating in a space of activism as well as um, academia um, and doing a lot of activist work in relation to disrupting um, dominant 
models of sex and sexuality, particularly around um, genital um, cosmetic surgery and other things. So she is, I think, someone who I connected with a few years out of my PhD and has been a, a very sort of strong influence. And the fourth, fourth person in a in a in a um, less substantial way, but no less significant way, would be Maggie Weatherall as well. Um, and I met her before I went to do my PhD, um, and and she eventually became a colleague at the University of Auckland for some time as well. And I think one of the um, key ways that I would see her as having been um, influential as being another New Zealander who went to the UK on, I think she had the same scholarship that I had and had gone much earlier and kind of understood the navigating in that space, which is mm. more complicated than it might seem. Yeah. Yeah, actually now that you now that you kind of touch on that, um how how was that experience to to go to a totally different country and kind of uh, and was the psychology different in any way you know the the area the fields mm, um yes <laughs> yes it was different but I think um I think you know Maggie sort of um warned me I guess about the experience of shifting from you know a colonized country to a kind of colonial center and the sort of um like one of the narratives you have about the UK and New Zealand is kind of gone now. Um, but it used to be a dominant narrative, you know, the mother country. And this almost this idea that, you know, our identity is English, you know, is we're New Zealanders, but we're English, you know, like this kind of ridiculous thing. It's not quite, you know, not stated in those kind of explicit terms, but you know, there's not it's encapsulated in that notion of the mother country. And I really didn't think um, the process of transitioning from the New Zealand cultural context to the um, English cultural context would be difficult and challenging. And yet it really was um, because it felt uncomfortable and wrong and unfamiliar in all sorts of ways. And I got so many things so wrong because I just had no idea how to read social cues. Um, in an English context and you know interaction is so different and yeah and it was really so it was really quite an overwhelming experience and Maggie had kind of prepared me for that a little bit generally grateful for um, but she'd also you know she'd also kind of commented on what the intellectual experience would be like and the intellectual experience was also really overwhelming like I think um the people I was surrounded with had read more, had thought more, were more confident in their positions and understandings of psychology. So it felt like, you know, it really did feel like being the little kid from the colonies who turns up and feels clueless. And, you know, like that was both life and <laughs> and intellectual environment. And and the last for context, um encouraged us to be, you know, knowledgeable, opinionated, argumentative, um, reflect on, consider things like, you know, not always, um, I don't think always entirely in positive ways, but it, it encouraged that kind of um, fiery, fierce, thoughtful, engaged debate, deeply intellectual, of course, but, you know, like that kind of thing. And so um, it was, it was a, it was a, I, and I don't know to what extent that was partly particular to Loughborough and what it had with the, you know, the incredible scholars that it had there and the sort of types of students that went there and whether that was um, a familiar experience for other people of my kind of age doing PhDs or not. But it was, um, I think it was a daunting place. Um, and I don't think I was quite prepared for that, how daunting um, it was going to be. Yeah. I can't imagine that. I'm sure it was, uh, yeah, quite tough, as, as you describe. Um, yeah. Maggie said something to me like, sorry, she said something to me like, you know, everyone will have read more than you. Everyone will have thought more than you. Everyone will have, you know, 
opinions about things, but don't let that put you off. You mm. know, if it was a real like, this is what you will expect, and that's exactly what it felt like. Gosh. Um, do you think, yeah, so so perhaps that might have been to do with kind of different educational systems, perhaps? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I think so, definitely. Mm. And probably just a big watch of personal insecurity as well. <laughs> Someone else might have been like, this is amazing. I'm part of this thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I imagine that'd be tough um brilliant uh so I suppose then um moving on to to your work more specifically um do you have a kind of particular accomplishment or piece of work that you're most proud of well I think that's really um it's not a feminist piece of work but it would be so hard to sort of go beyond the thematic analysis paper that um, Victoria Clark and I um, co-wrote um, because it has been influential in ways we never expected or anticipated or wanted. Um, and so Victoria and I met on, I think, the first day of our PhDs. We were um, both in that cohort at LACRA and supervised um, by Zoom Celia. Um, and um, yeah, no, we wrote that paper some years later, which came out of our Lachlan experiences to some extent. Mm. And it has been, I guess, influential for shaping a method, for shaping the way people do qualitative research in some domains, um, not always in good ways. Um, but I think, you know, and so it's a, like, it's a funny question, like proud of, like at a, at a level, I feel like it's, it's given a lot, you know, like the the value and the contribution that it has made has been substantial and that feels really good and mm. worthwhile. Um, but in terms of um, my, my thinking, you know, like I, I think there would be, um, to come back to that question of loving research that I talked about, you know, that, that sort of process of um, grappling with data and ideas and thinking and working something out in a process um, of kind of analysis and theorizing and sense making. I think, you know, there's a paper that I wrote which looked at how um, condoms were being constructed in a certain way and talked about in relation to heterosexual. Um, sexual safety and sexual risk, which took me years and years to write because I kind of just had no time and I kept coming back to it. But actually that paper, I think, for me, feels like I got somewhere with the analysis that we don't often get the opportunity to do because we're often pushed by time pressures or other things, you know. So in terms of kind of my thinking and my kind of research, that would be the thing that I'm most satisfied with it mm, good yeah oh I I like that so yeah interesting um thank you I'm just going to just um put the light on before I ask my next question because I can see it darkening okay. here <laughs> there we go sorry about There's that lightening here and I'm looking less orange <laughs> At home, the lights are such that I always look orange on Zoom. So <laughs> I'm looking less orange now, so that's good. Yeah, I can't see any orangeness, so no. brilliant. Um, yes, so um, thinking about your kind of more methodological work then in terms of kind of um, the qualitative research methods and, and particularly thematic analysis as, as you're talking about, um, could you maybe tell me a bit about how that work has kind of developed over the years? Yeah, I we, you know, Loughborough, to kind of go back to Loughborough, as it, it all starts there, which it doesn't, but, um, you know, and Sue and Celia in particular, really, um, but the whole of the kind of Loughborough social sciences push this kind of 
methodological curiosity and a way of um, always questioning yourself and always questioning kind of things about data and what you're doing when you're doing research and how you're doing it and you know what what did data mean and you know what kind of claims can you be making and what evidence base can you make those claims from and so we were in this kind of environment of like deep methodological questioning and then you'd kind of um and I think one of the things that really drove that well I've never I don't think I've ever expressed it in quite this way before but was this sense of needing a methodological in integrity um and you know this is methodological and kind of co conceptual coherence and in the ways research and analysis are done and undertaken and you know um that those aren't my own terms that they come from you know other scholars but really, that's what they were asking us to do, to defend, you know, everything. And, you know, why can you claim this on the basis of, you know, that? And doesn't this mean that, although you think you're getting that from your interviews, how can you know that that's what you're getting from your interviews? You know, what's the basis for being able to make those claims? And it led to us being, I think Victoria and I in a paper described ourselves as being kind of bratty because, you know, we were so sort of full of these um, notions that we'd be, you know, at, at conferences privately, critical of like presentations with that seemed you know methodologically incoherent or where things were not sort of thought through in the way that we'd been sort of pushed into thinking things through. So we eventually wrote that thematic analysis paper and we wrote it quite quickly in a in a very kind of like literally in one room for a week, talking through researching, writing, putting it together, making sense of it. And we realized after some years when it started to get popular and we'd start to hear people making claims about what we said in the paper that were like, we didn't say that. And you have to, you know, go back and look at it and go, did I say that? And you're like, no, I didn't say that. You know, oh my goodness. <laughs> Thank goodness. Or, you know, maybe misread the things that we thought were relatively clearly expressed or articulated. And it's made us realise that, you know, even though, as reflexive scholars, you can access some of those kind of assumptions and things that shape what you do. You, you never, you never have that kind of full and final um, access to that. And that there were um, assumptions and ideas and things in there that we kind of needed to explicate more clearly and more fully. So over the course of writing about thematic analysis, I think what we've really um, clarified is the value space on which a kind of reflexive approach to thematic analysis operates and a clearer sense of the things that connect and the things that differentiate different approaches to thematic analysis and at the time we really just wrote about thematic analysis but now given how popular and widely used the the approach has become it's important to kind of understand you know um that there's a, there is a lot of diversity and some of the approaches have very different values bases. So we've sort of yeah. explored some of those different aspects and the ways um, different, say, quality criteria need to be applied and if you're using different approaches and really sort of pushing for a more thoughtful approach to, to method and methodology. And then at the same time, we've just had quite a lot of fun exploring other methodological um, questions like um, um, the, the approach story completion, which you know we were first introduced to by Celia um, as a kind of um, as a method to sort of explore and and have a go with, and you know we've since done quite a lot of work exploring the potential of that and having a lot of fun and a lot of success with it as a method, um, and um, exploring the potential of kind of a range of, um, I guess, online or virtual approaches. So we edited a book on, you know, collecting qualitative data where in a context where there was, you know, very little discussion actually really about data beyond interviews and focus groups. Mm. And it was pre-pandemic and we kind of laughed to ourselves that in some ways we were, <laughs> we were sort of anticipating a context in which people, you know, had to switch and transition out of what had been, in some areas, and I think psychology um, is, is part of this, a sort of fairly um, 
well-established sort of canon of ways of collecting data that some people were exploring and exploding, but the qualitative um, methodological explorations, I think, within psychology are still quite um, constrained compared to some other disciplinary contexts. Mm. Um, and reflecting quite different, you know, disciplines, quite different histories, quite different research questions and those sorts of things. But also, you know, compared to some some other disciplines, I think there's a bit of conservatism in, in the sort of psychological qualitative fields. There's also lots of creativity, but that's not to sort of sound like a dissing or the amazing uh, creative and exciting uh, methodological work that is going on in psychology. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that's a really interesting distinction that you make there, or, or kind of um, you know trend, I suppose, in in those different uh, disciplines. Um, yeah, I think we sort of we have to sort of we get asked to write across disciplines sometimes, and it's quite interesting to sort of encounter debates or issues or be confronted with, like, what do you make of this? And it's like, well, that is not even a consideration or a concern or a challenge that, that you know that's really part of a discussion in psychology mm. um, or in the psychology world that we operate in but I'm sure you know that's a positionality thing too and as an outsider looking into these contexts if you're in those contexts you might have a very similar take um in which you know, able to understand what they are far better than I can yeah no that's really interesting and and so I'm just wondering because um I suppose talking about Loughborough and that kind of methodological um uh thought was it um I suppose just thinking in terms of kind of mainstream psychology and um you know the almost obsession with like quantitative work and um how was that in in Loughborough and uh, or maybe also like in comparison to how it was um in New Zealand uh you know what was the what was that like for you and and was that like a a kind of easy path that you went down it's a really good it's a, that's a, a really good kind of thing to reflect on and I I I, I think I feel incredibly privileged in that unlike many people who do qualitative or feminist or critical or queer or you know a, approaches in psychology that challenge that kind of mainstream dominance I really feel that I have virtually gone through without having that challenge or having that question or really having to kind of defend it and I know that that's not most people's um, many people's experience so at, at Auckland um, as an undergraduate you were certainly, and as a master's student, certainly aware of the dominance and the norms and the expectations of kind of quantitative positivism and, and those sorts of things. But I could kind of operate in parallel to that, you know. And so I think, you know, Nicola and her work and, you know, a few others created environments for, for work to flourish sort of alongside that in silent parallel. Um, and... I think, you know, when I came back to Auckland and, and started work here, I think I felt almost like that, that I was sort of just silently going along and doing my thing and hopefully nobody would notice. And, and you know, I wouldn't get, you know, found out that I wasn't one of the positive, yeah. positive, 10 quantitative positivism. Um, but um, at Loughborough, it was like that, it was like that whole kind of context was sort of just absent like in it I think it's a it meant that we didn't have to deal with the kind of intellectual load of dealing with that you know we could just focus on what we were doing on our own terms and those terms weren't set by somebody else and they weren't set by a set of context and conditions that weren't relevant or appropriate um, and there's lots of ways that you could kind of parallel those environments to other contexts or other kind of situations or you know um you know marginalized or minoritized students coming into university contexts you know how do we create environments that allow them to exist and operate in their own terms rather than you know being forced into the kind of normative dominant 
structures. And so there's, there's kind of lots of parallels for how incredibly um, freeing and liberating and from a pedagogical perspective, incredibly positive and empowering that kind of context is. And, yeah. you know, not having to kind of defend doing qualitative research, let alone critical feminist qualitative research, really liberates you. Not having to kind of engage with those conversations of why didn't you do numbers or why didn't you do an experiment, it really liberates you to kind of embrace what you are doing and explore the potential of it and do better work because of it, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a really interesting perspective. Um, yeah, and so you haven't really met any tension there um, during your career in Auckland either then? Not really. Like, mm. I think, you know, um, like sort of critical psychology, there's been, there's always been a good community, a small community and a good community. And we got to a point where we had... Um, a number of academics like within psychology at Auckland. Um, and, you know, we have, you know, critical psychology, where you draw those boundaries, feminist psychology, you know, there's these overlapping things. You know, we have Māori and Pacifica psychologists who kind of um, are situated within or close or, you know, like, um, and, you know, critical um, scholars and um, who might be, you know, primarily community psychology or or those sorts of things. So there's this, we kind of have this, um, a group of, um, I guess, like-minded individuals. But for a long time, it was relatively, uh, relatively few of us with students working in, in these kinds of ways and building connections with communities outside and outside of the discipline, mm -hmm. at least in part. Um, and I remember, I think it was it was when it was after Maggie had joined us that it really felt like you know because she was such a kind of Maggie Wood or you know she was such a um, influential figure um, and so important and you know having her being able to kind of have her come back and be in New Zealand, be at Auckland, um, really felt that it kind of gave a sort of a weight to critical and qualitative approaches. And, you know, we had a, a big um, retreat for the, um, the School of Psychology at one time, and one of the things we had to map was, you know, where in, in small groups, you know, small group activities, <laughs> fun times, we had to map, you know, where we saw the strengths of the school and blah, blah, blah. And virtually every group put critical as like one of the top two strengths and it was kind of this moment that blew me away and I was like but I'm like this little marginalized person over here and it just really sort of um it it made me realize how much we can kind of hold on to these narratives too and these positionalities which don't necessarily reflect um context and it's good to um good to question those but I but to come back to your question you know mostly not mostly not having to deal with that sort of that resistance and I think it's good you know some people say oh it makes you better because you get your arguments better or you know you know how to fight and to challenge them I'm like we don't need that you know why do we need that mm. the quantitative people who make those points they're not arguing that you know they need to defend themselves against qualitative and critical approaches so just take it away yeah it's, that's so it's true. not like that's not the adversity that produces great resilience you know like get rid of all this stuff yeah yeah interesting um oh lovely so going more to um different uh, aspects of your work then you obviously do quite a lot of work around kind of gendered bodies um hair removal and stuff like that could you tell me a bit about those kind of topics and um, maybe what interested you um in those i think yeah i so i've done you know, a cluster of um, research around um, body hair norms and body hair practices and body hair sort of removal or retention practices, sometimes with students, sometimes with colleagues, mm -hmm. um, and the genital cosmetic surgery, which I sort of tried to get away from, but kept dipping back into every now and then. Um, and 
you know, hoping that it was one of those things that would go away. And I think I've always been, I mean, I think I've always been interested in how ideas about, or normative ideas or sort of societally available ideas um, shift and shape what's possible for people to, you know, to practice, to do, to experience and how they can feel and be as individuals. And those body practices have been often demarcated on a kind of binary gendered idea. You know, this is what a woman looks like in terms of body hair. This is what a man looks like in terms of body hair. Um, and so a lot, I think, if I'm trying to, you know, go beyond specific topics, a lot of my interest is in, you know, how do people um, navigate and make sense of this meaning-making world that they operate within. But I think I'm, I'm at least as interested in that world itself. Like, what is what is being made available to us? How are we um, being? What opportunities are we being offered up and how do we kind of then navigate and make sense of those opportunities? Um, and the, you know, and the, I think, you know, if we're talking about um, gender and gendered body, you know, the, the context has changed a lot in the last decade in terms of kind of understanding and context and um, ways of being. Um, Obviously, you know, not necessarily um, unfraught um, for people, um, but still the kinds of um, questioning of rigid binaries and those kinds of rigid ideas about gendered bodies um, has been, um, I feel like I couldn't have anticipated that, you know, what's happened now would have happened you know, 20 years ago. But at the same time, it was sort of those critiques were, were being made and those those challenges to kind of very kind of heteronormative or cis-heteronormative ideas about gender and bodies were, were being made um, yeah. at that time. Yeah, oh, that's really interesting. Thank you. Um, so... I also wanted to ask that you've been, um, you have been an editor uh, for the journal Feminism Psychology as well. And I was wondering um, maybe kind of what that, what that role was like and did it influence your understanding of, of feminist psychology uh, as a field? Yeah, I, um, I, I was actually um, thinking that when I was talking about the mentoring and things of, you know, Sue and Celia, um, that one of the things I forgot to mention was, you know, that they encouraged opportunities like that. So I worked as an um, editorial assistant for a little while on feminism and psychology, um, along with others like Victoria Clark at different times. Um, and so got some sort of insight or understanding into um, the publishing world that, you know, you wouldn't necessarily get at that stage or at any stage um, if you're not sort of actively involved. And then, you know, the opportunity to to, to co-edit with Nicola Gavey was really an amazing experience. And it, it kind of felt like an opportunity and a bit of a responsibility at the same time because the journal was a beloved journal and, you know, a, a significant journal um, for a community of feminist psychology. Um, and... I think um, we made a decision to really sort of focus as an editorial decision to really sort of um, focus on the critical um, qualitative um, approaches um, within the journal rather than kind of being a kind of potential home for a wide range. Um, you know, the other feminist psychology journals like PWQ and sex roles were doing that um, or offered a home to other approaches. Um, and so I think what you what you get to see as an editor is the vast array of research and ideas that are engaged with that don't necessarily 
get through a publication. And so you have, I think, much more of a richer sense of kind of what's going on um, and what are the things that are people finding interesting or curious or urgent or necessary and so on. And so um, I think I think it, it you know, it, it's sort of a curious um, obligation and I didn't come up with this idea myself. Um, with someone I interviewed for a piece that I can't remember who it was now, so apologies to whoever it was who said this. But you know, like you also have a kind of uh, ethical obligation and a responsibility because, like, um, you know, you're not just you are not simply um, revealing something. You are the journal process also is actively part of shaping what feminist psychology is and becomes because you are as an editor of these journals you are the you are publishing the material which shapes the field mm. and so it's a it's a sort of it's a responsibility in that way um and I think you know we we had conversations about and uh, you know never quite I think did as well as we would have wanted to in terms of how do you get past, you know, English language dominance? How do you get past um, Anglo-Western frameworks? How do you get past white dominance in terms of scholars and academia and um, and those kinds of things? And I think those remain challenges for for academia more broadly as well as you know feminist um, the, the sort of challenges that we were we were facing. But I think it's those are really important questions because, um, like the question of who you know, who's who's teaching you know why is my professor white for instance you know it's the same kind of questions it's like you know who gets who gets um, whose knowledge is appearing in those spaces and whose knowledge is therefore part of what becomes a canon if we want to think of published knowledge as that of what this field is. Mm. Um, so it was a really, um, and I think in some ways I can kind of reflect back on those things a bit more in retrospect. Um, and they are ongoing conversations. They are ongoing um, discussions and debates and considerations. Um, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, that sort of spiraled out from what you were asking no. about, but it's amazing. Perfect, perfect. Um, okay, and that's... a lot of work. Yeah, I'm <laughs> sure. Saying, a lot of work. There is, a, you know, I, I think, People don't realize, and I think maybe people don't realize how much work goes into editing and how hard it is. And we can sit there as scholars be frustrated by the delays in the process and those sorts of things. But it's yeah, it's it's a lot of work. Yeah, I can I can imagine. Yeah. So I'll just switch gears a little bit then and um, go back to talking about um, the psychology of women in the quality section of the BPS, which you. Um, touched on earlier so um, I suppose mm -hmm. just wanted uh, wondering if you wanted to tell me a little bit more about your involvement with POWs and what was that like? Yeah I so my first kind of connection with POWs was in um, in that first conference which was uh, described as kind of like wow or inspiring kind of moment mm -hmm. and and sometime not long after, I I became, I was the sort of postgrad rep um, for SIPAG on POWs. I have, like, I was trying to think about how did this come about? How did this happen? And I had absolutely no idea how it came about and how it happened. So I was on the committee, um, the POWs committee, sometime between 97 and 2000, mm. <laughs> 2000 um, as, that, as that SIPAG rep. But I think it was, I think it was, I think I always felt like because I came in the SIPAG group, like because I was like the SIPAG rep, I never sort of felt like I was like quite fully part of POWs, which is ridiculous. Nobody made me feel like that, but um, it didn't feel like it was my kind of primary entry point, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Like um, I came in in a sort of specific role. But yeah, so that was a really um, a great opportunity to sort of 
get connected with um, a range of like feminist academics who were, you know, like like the FMP editorial kind of assistant role. You know, these kind of very junior entry points into spaces of decision making and engagement and thinking and and community and connection, um, which um, was really um, fantastic. And don't ask me about the thing that happened in those meetings because I I can't remember. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then I. I have re remained, you know, connected to PALS ever since. And it, it really feels like, and since coming back to New Zealand, I have been to a majority of the annual conferences. I wouldn't say, you know, it, it, it is, you know, it is, it has always been my kind of, it feels like, it feels like a kind of intellectual home, you know, like it feels like a kind of space of community because there are, so many people that have you know built up those connections with over the years um yeah and yeah it's been something to to miss in lockdown as well and, and through COVID you know to not be able to kind of go back um into those into those spaces sorry I got distracted by getting getting onto COVID oh yeah um oh that's that's brilliant so quite kind of a a major part of um or, or you're quite involved then with kind of going to conferences and um yeah being on the committee early on um and so yeah, not, yeah, sorry I was gonna say a, a minor a minor committee role but but definitely a kind of a sense of identification and as a, as a kind of key part of this is a key part of my scholarly community in my scholarly sort of world that yeah. I still I still feel that way oh that's brilliant so kind of yeah like a network of people um that you were able to yeah create yeah mm, brilliant um and so do you think POWs has maybe developed over the years um and also, do you think it should be developing in the future? I think it has developed, yes. Um, and, you know, like some of the early debates about, you know, that um, should it be, you know, feminist psychology or should it be psychology of women and, you know, those um, and now psychology of women and equality section, you know, so those language is something that has shifted um when I was on the committee now that you've asked that question I can remember that you know that language debate was a language debate that we revisited fiercely as a committee you know we were pals but should we be trying to push for feminist psychology you know should this be a different orientation um and how's persisted. I can't quite remember the full details of the debate, but it was like a really a good discussion and consideration. Um, and I think so. So it has evolved, but I think that's right, and it should. You know, organisations are organisations that occur in contexts, and I think powers have a number of contexts that it exists within. You know, one is the context of the BPS, and so the context of the BPS was part of um a delimiting factor in terms of thinking about naming and language and and those sorts of aspects um and then it exists in the context of the scholarly community and its and its membership and who it's responding to and who it um who it provides a kind of welcoming home for um and uh, you know, and who it doesn't, you know, who who it sort of inadvertently or whatever um, doesn't provide that home for. And, uh, you know, like I I, I feel lucky in that um, for me it, it's like, you know, it's a comfortable space um, because it's been that kind of intellectual and community home for a long time. But 
you know, I know that's, you know, that reflects a particular entry point and a particular engagement and a particular set of possibilities. Mm. Um, and the third context is, you know, is the societal context. And so, you know, the 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 name change, you know, I did not participate in the um, discussions and debates about the change from pals to pals, um, <laughs> you know, with the addition of um, equalities. But, you know, it's responding to and reflecting different contexts and different understandings and different analyses. And that feels entirely right um, and entirely appropriate. Um, our social political context change and our scholarly context change as well. Um, and, you know, we have really pressing, urgent needs and issues in the world now that we didn't have you know, a decade ago, or that weren't visible, no, not that we didn't have them, but they maybe weren't visible um, yeah. in the ways that they are now. And so it seems right that, you know, as, you know, as a, a community of psychologists, which have founded in um, a history of activism and a history of social change and a history of, you know, of, social justice or, you know, a push for social justice, it feels important that the organisation continues to kind of hold that, for me, to hold that as core. And that, for me, that also involves, you know, turning the lens on yourself and going, you know, what are the things that we are doing well and what are the things that we're doing that we need to do better or that we haven't quite got there yet. Yeah. Um, and, you know, um and, and powers can't necessarily solve all those things, but how how can it be part of the change or or resource or facilitate um, change? Mm. Um, so how can it how can it um, work to create more um, inclusive environments? Um, you know, whether it's around you know disability or race or you know gender, those sorts of um, important aspects that. Um, uh, maybe you know have been under maybe under kind of represented in terms of you know who goes to pals and you know who participates in that space and does it just reflect our you know our community of scholars and, and PhD students or you know and if it does you know do we have an obligation to to be in there actively pushing for psychology as a discipline to change more broadly to mm. um to shift that rather than just responding. Now, I'm not saying ours is just responding at all, but that's what feels important for me in terms of kind of ongoing change and the need for ongoing change. Absolutely. Yeah, that's so important. Um, brilliant. Thank you. Um, I'm also just wondering uh, whether you've been involved with kind of other feminist organisations that are maybe similar uh, in sense to, to POWs. Yeah, not not particularly because we haven't had like a sort of feminist psychology organisation in New Zealand or even Australia, I don't think, you know. So there's been nothing kind of local, or well, not while I've been, not while I've been here. There have been kind of discussions about those sorts of things. Um, but our psychological society operates and exists in a quite different way to how it exists, how the BPS exists or how the APA in the States exists. Like it's, it's, yeah. um, it doesn't occupy the same sort of space um, here. Um, and, you know, it's, a, it's just a smaller community. And I have been a member of um, the psychology of oh, Division 35, whatever it is, of the APA at different points and, you know, been to conferences and the association um, I can never remember whether it's of or for women in psychology, AWP, which um, both of which are sort of feminist psychology organisations in the US, um, but they don't get bigger. Um, and so, you know, AWP, I think, is, in my experience, most resembles PALS in the sense of community, whereas PWQ is, in my experience, feels bigger and kind of a bit overwhelming. And that may be because I've had connections into AWP particularly or, you know, those sorts of things. Um, yeah. But they don't feel like 
they feel like the for me they've never felt the same easy fit as ours I guess and that's a that's a, a combination of context of connections and personal connections um, and also of intellectual traditions and the difference different intellectual traditions in the UK versus the US in terms of feminist psychology um, yeah Oh, so and then, you know, I've been, yeah, I was going to say, I've been part of the, you know, I was part of the New View, um, which is the New View campaign around sort of um, women's sexuality with Lynn and Tepa's organisation. So I was involved in that for a number of years as well, but that's not a, that's not a sort of organisation that is, it was a looser, sort of more activist oriented kind of collection of scholars and clinicians and other people. Mm. Um uh, not a sort of formal body like houses. Right. Yeah. Oh no, that's really interesting. Um and and so do you think that involvement with powers impacts impacts your work? I, I know we've talked a bit about kind of that network and stuff, but um yeah, has it influenced your work and, and maybe your path in any way? Um that's a good question and and um I'm not sure in any direct way. Mm. Like it feels like, um, I think I would say indirectly in the sense that it provided a space for validation of the type of scholarship that I was doing when I was fairly junior and fairly, you know, PhD and, you know, early career academic and that sort of thing. So it, it, it provided, I think, a, um, a a nurturing environment um, in which to feel like, you know, your work, even though I wasn't being, as I said, explicitly challenged, but it still provided that sort of sense and also a sense of a community that you could, in terms of conferences, go and present your ideas to. And you knew that the community there would get it and they would also be able to ask questions and critique and engage. So a sense of yeah. a scholarly community beyond, you know, beyond the local um ones that that I had um and so I think that's that's probably the main sort of influence but then of course you know the you know less directly all the the work of the uh, you know amazing scholars that make up pals as well um you know has been kind of influential in terms of shaping thinking and ideas and that sort of thing so yeah and to indirect influences I think brilliant Lovely. Okay, well, I'm getting to the end now. So um, <laughs> just in terms of feminism and, and psychology more broadly, um, what impact do you think feminists have made in psychology so far? And and where do you think uh, remains remains to be done? Good mm, questions. Um... I think... I think feminists have been, you know, some feminists have been really influential in disrupting and challenging the, what was the male stream, you know, like that language, the male stream. Yeah. And so those kinds of feminist challenges to male-centric thinking and, and kind of male norms within psychology and you know I'm using that language because I'm reflecting the context of the time they were operating in in the 70s and other you know in those kinds of contexts and and you know the work of key influential feminist psychologists um, to disrupt or challenge key theorists um, and key theories um, you know has been you know really influential um, often I think maybe under acknowledged in a, in the mainstream context as a feminist specifically feminist kind of influence um yeah. but so I think yeah and I think you know but then I but then I question this because you know I have so little to do with mainstream positivist quantitative psychology and you know I just don't engage I just don't have time so or maybe I'm like I'm going, yeah, and they're really thinking more kind of complexly about gender and, you know, they're not using these kind of like 
some little sex difference framework for researching and writing. I was like, no, they probably still are. And I'm just, so I, I don't even want to claim that. I'll just say big influences in some ways, there's still lots of challenges. And I think, yeah. you know, going forward, I think, you know, I think, I can't remember what the second part of your question was, um, but if it is, it is what I think it was, I think, you know, what our challenges are is to more completely decenter our norms and disrupt the norms and the centrality of um, whiteness, the centrality of, you know, ableness, the centrality of, you know, all sorts of dimensions of privilege, which have had until relatively recently, and with the exception of some small kind of pockets of amazing work and activism, have kind of, you know, there's still so much to do there, you know, and so much to to, to um, allow spaces for completely different knowledge frameworks and completely different ways of kind of thinking and engaging. And, you know, we're really lucky in New Zealand that we have, you know, a growing cohort of Indigenous psychologists, Māori psychology, um, Pacifica psychologists who are building and specialising and growing and developing um, knowledges which divert from, divert from, diverge from um, and provide, you know, um, other ways of thinking about and doing psychology and you know and yet what we teach you know um until quite recently there's still been this very kind of anglo white anglo centric kind of normative model of psychology and so there's still that feels like those feel like the things that are important and i think you know recognizing and thinking about what challenges we have to grapple with and a world that's, you know, currently in a pandemic that's not going anywhere um, in a context of increasing and vast and gross inequities and growing inequities and, impos you know, increasing poverty and those kinds of challenges. Um, and um, climate change, climate, you know, catastrophe that is kind of, you know, as the UK has been experiencing recently mm. with heat waves we are having mass flooding in New Zealand at the moment because we've had you know the wettest July on record in many places um you know a world that is kind of rapidly shifting you know white supremacy as a kind of growing threat and kind of fascist kind of movements like what are our responsibilities then as, as a discipline and that feels to me like as you know feminists we have a kind of very important conversation to be having about change um, and what we do in terms of research and practice and teaching and how we kind of mentor um, future generations into a space where this is a kind of very different context from the, the context in which maybe we, you know, started becoming academics. And... Yeah, absolutely. Brilliant. And so Sorry, that was a whole lot of things. <laughs> no, that was lovely. <laughs> Great. Very comprehensive. Um, lastly, what advice would you give to feminists entering psychology now? I would say if anybody questions feminism as relevant or central to what you want to do, like if you're talking to someone who's a supervisor or a potential supervisor, uh, or a mentor in any way, or influential in any way, um, don't don't take their word. You know, don't you know? Go and find someone else because mm. you know that is a archaic view that nobody should be expressing anymore. Yeah. And you know, find the right people to talk to because there are people out there who will support what it is that you want to do as a you know as a as a feminist psychologist and, and someone using and exploring psychology through a feminist framework. Um, there will be people, there are communities, and to find those communities or those scholars within your department or through online networks or whatever it is um, that can kind of support what you want to do. 
Lovely. That's very nice. Yeah, thank you. Brilliant. So I think I think we're done. I think I've covered everything that I want. Is there anything else um, that I haven't mentioned that you want to touch on? I'm sure there might be, but I'm a bit tired. So I can't think of anything. Um, I'm so I surprised myself by talking a lot. So I, I, hope, um, I hope I didn't talk too much. No, it's been absolutely brilliant. Thank you so much. I've really enjoyed listening to you. Um, and it's, yeah, it's just been great. Uh, oh, I want to ask for the record. Could you state your gender? Um, yeah, I am a woman and I guess um, I, it's a slightly complicated question because this is not a, it's not a, um, I mean, I'm a cisgender woman, uh, but I, I don't know that that would be my identity now if I was 30 or 20 um, mm -hmm. because I, you know, I was a, a tomboy throughout my whole um, adolescence and I think it's interesting to reflect on the ways this identity sits or has solidified um, but isn't necessarily the identity I would have now if I had come up in a different context, I guess. So it's, it's sort of like, it's not a way of trying to avoid the question or disclaim an identity, but it's a slightly more complicated one than it might seem. Okay, no, thank you. That's that's really interesting. Okay. Um, and then also, could you uh, say your place and date of birth? Yeah, I was born in Hamilton in New Zealand um, in 30th of September, 1972. Should have had to have had to think about that. <laughs> And uh, your occupation? I am an academic. I'm a professor in the School of Psychology from the University of Auckland. Lovely. Thank you so much. Um, I did think of one thing I wanted to say, yes. which was that I apologise to anybody that I have inadvertently, through my bad memory, left out of this discussion. <laughs>